welcome everyone to another broadcast of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived for free downloading. Visit artistfirst.com. And now out to your host, it's Arthur D. Schwartz. Why, hello everybody. Welcome to the show. This is going to be a really, really fun, uh, fun evening, I think, because it's a subject very dear to my heart. I'm extremely interested in the um, ancient alien hypothesis. Um, I used to, yeah, used to, I used to be, I used to call ancient a- astronauts. I know the terms a- ancient astronauts and uh, ancient uh, aliens are used interchangeably. Uh, but I did come to the conclusion that ancient aliens is probably uh, a better term uh, because it's, it imparts, I think, um, the meaning, the idea that there was a alien race that had something to do with the development of the human species. And uh, so there are ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, ancient Egyptians, and perhaps there were ancient aliens. Uh, ancient astronaut sounds like uh, you know they just kind of came by and uh, you know looked around and left. Uh, but I, you know, if you believe in, in what, um, if you believe in the theory, I, of course, it's much more substantial than that. So uh, we're going to talk about it, and 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 here's the thing. So my guest tonight, uh, Martin Roy Hill, has written uh, a novella called Eden, and uh, it talks about uh, this subject. Um, it's basically uh, an extract. He extracted the basic theme that uh, of the of Zechariah Sitchin um, books, the, um, the the Twelfth Planet, and the, you know some of you might be familiar with it. And uh, that that uh, he looked at Sumerian writings and, and draw you know these uh, conclusions that there there was an ancient race that was uh, helping civilization along. Um, but the thing is, it, it, you know, uh, Martin's book is a novel, and he himself is not a complete sold in the subject. Uh, I try to keep an open mind, but I must say that I am inclined, uh, pretty strongly inclined, to believe in the in the theory of or, or the hypothesis. And so this is going to be a, a fun conversation, looking at the philosophical implications, uh, dealing with um, the, the factual things involved it's, to the extent of, of our ability to do so. Uh, and uh, but we'll try to make the, the speculations uh, reasonable. But this is the idea here. This is going to be fun philosophy, fun speculation. Um, no pretenses here. Now my guest, uh, Martin Roy Hill, has spent more than 20 years as a staff reporter and editor for newspapers and magazines before becoming a Navy analyst specializing in battlefield medical operations. His freelance credits include Reader's Digest, Life. Newsweek, Omni, American History, Coast Guard Magazine, Retired Officer Magazine, and the Los Angeles Times Sunday Opinion section, and many more. Uh, he's also um, published many short stories, uh, such publications as Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine, uh, the, the uh, Alternative History, the Journal of Historical Fiction and Alternative History, San Diego Magazine, San Diego's writer, San Diego Writers Monthly, and the Plan B Mystery Anthology and website. He's a very interesting guy with a very eclectic background. Uh, in addition to his authorship life existence, uh, his daytime job is uh, in, in, in the area right now as a, uh, let's see, a, he, you're, help me, well, let me see, you, you're now serve as an executive officer of a state military police battalion in the California State Military Reserve, a component of the California National Guard, and you spent more than 13 years, has 13 years experience in maritime and wilderness search and rescue, disaster response, and taught wilderness survival and first aid. Wow. You, you have quite a broad experience and probably not the typical background, I think, for, for someone who, uh, who has written a book about ancient aliens. Anyway, I'd like to introduce um, my guest right now, Martin Roy Hill. How are you today, Martin? I'm doing fine, Arthur. Um, thank you for having me, and hello to all of your listeners. Uh, so tell me about this book, that um, you know, this novella that, uh, that I read. It's really a fun read. And why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, what got you to it and uh, what you were trying to... Was it purely uh, fun, or did you, are you, were you trying to um, present uh, a more serious argument or you know, side as well? I've always been very interested in the um, um, 
as you you call it, the ancient alien theory. I I I, I read many of uh, Eric Van Daniken's books when I was much younger, um, and I enjoy watching the TV show Ancient Aliens. Um, what got me interested in this book, um, in, in get, the genesis of the idea, was um, watching Ancient Aliens and starting to wonder. Um, you know, at the at the at the beginning, the, the narrator always says, "You know, here's this theory. What if it were true?" And I started to think, "Well, what if it were true? Why would they come here? Why would they deal with a primitive race like us?" And I started to think it through, and I eventually kind of came to the conclusion because they were probably very much like we are today. Um, they came here, and you know, as Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered. You know, the the the, the Europeans went to the New World and and enslaved the uh, the Native Americans there, in, in in their search for gold. And I concluded that pretty much, probably the same thing would have happened if this were true. Probably would have happened along the same lines, except instead of coming in ships, they came in spacecraft. Well, Martin, right off the bat, we have an interesting philosophical question here, I would say, because it sounds to me you're perhaps a little bit of a um, uh, a pessimist in a way, or shall we say... Um, a curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> because you're, you're, you're arguing here that uh, the aliens, um, if, they were, if they are such, um, would have... Despite your, you know, great development, able to, you know, travel through space in, in enormous distances, still have the ethical uh, uh, foundation of um, uh, human beings uh, in the, you know, uh, in, in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. Well, you you mentioned earlier Alexander Stitchin, and his mm -hmm. his theory um, is pretty much the same thing. Uh, the, the, he bases his the the the, right. the 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 center of his theory on the Sumerian creation myth, much as I do in in Eden, um, and he his theory is that the this alien race, the Anunnaki's, came here um, to find gold. Did not like digging it up, and therefore they they created a slave race to dig it out for them. And that is pretty much the Sumerian uh, uh, creation myth. Um, the sky gods, the Anunnaki, came here. They needed workers, and so um, they created man in order to do the work for them. And if that doesn't sound like um, what the Europeans did in the New World, I don't know what does. Right. Um, well, I mean, I think there are some differences, uh, first of all, um, when the ancient aliens uh, would have come down, you know, in, in, you know, in, in terms of the drama that uh, Sitchin was uh, uh, talking about, uh, you didn't have humans. Um, they, they were, you know, they were apes. Um, there was a hybridization, right? And uh, then gradually um, brought, you know, into existence the um, Homo sapien, Homo sapien, and um, uh, so I think there's a the difference there as to uh, then, for example, colonists, uh, colonials, uh, just suppressing um, native populations and treating them, you know, very badly. Uh, the 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 the, uh, um, the beings that um, were on the planet uh, you know, when when they would have arrived would literally have been animals. Right, or or very primitive humans, and 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 again, that's mm -hmm. that's also in my book. They use right. genetic uh, right. manipulation to, right. including their own genes mm -hmm. that that um, raise this these aboriginals up into uh, a, a type of being that they can train to work, that they can communicate with, mm -hmm. and eventually even mate with, and 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 develop their own societies with. As I say. Um, one of my main characters is is Nima, who in the uh, Sumerian mythology was the sister of Inca in Inki, and Inki, uh, Nima created in in the mythology Inc, uh, Nima created humans from the dirt, 
and handed them to Inky, who gave them jobs. In other words, she manipulated their genes, gave them over to Inky, and Inky put them into the into the mines. Um, and eventually, as they grew more um, uh, intelligent, they became more uh, um, uh, socialized. And and according to the mythology, they the gods, you know, mated with the the humans, the men, the the, the Sumerian um, humans, which were called Adamu, uh, and and had offspring with them. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely. And, and uh, uh, the the behavior of these uh, the, of this uh, these aliens, um, why well, was mixed? I would I would say, um, you know, some of them were vicious and and you know and, and very rep- you know we would repress the um, earthlings, um, and some were you know would appear to have more compassion. Wouldn't you say? Of course, and, and you you would see that in in the in the uh, um, the new world. You had you know some people that came in and and um, you know wiped out entire civilizations, and others that came into the new world and and worked with the 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 Native Americans. Right, right. I think it's, it is fascinating because um, to think about because um, human beings um, perhaps in not too many generations uh, from now um, could be in a similar situation uh, as we begin to travel the cosmos um, we will have to decide what we're going to do if we come across um, uh, you know uh, you know biological entities that have the potential for intelligence let's say or they are intelligent beings but extremely primitive uh, and I can I can see a strong case where, without uh, being necessarily cruel, uh, the, the 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 intervention would have to be such that uh, these beings um, would have to kind of develop their own sense, and that would mean that they would have to struggle because otherwise, uh, it, it, you basically. The, the question would be: Would you take this uh, this um, native population and then basically right from the get go um, introduce um, the alien culture? And so from the get go, there was really no evolution or development. They basically became the tutors, or, or they were the, the students of the of the aliens. I mean, I guess that's a possibility, but it seems more likely that the uh, alien spe- the alien species would want to uh, want them. The native population to develop and to evolve, you know, and so if that is the case, uh, one would have to ask, you know, how would you go about that while still intervening, but not trying to, but trying to disguise and then you, you, they could they present themselves as gods, or they were looked up as as gods, but actually um, they were just trying to help the species along. Now you're saying, well, they're they're really there for their self-interest alone. But I, I think that that's a, that's a really uh, well a question. Uh, how how altru- altruistic are are are, are we? You know, do uh-huh. we do anything for the well-being of other people? Yes, sure. A lot of good people are out there that do that. Uh-huh. A lot of people who tend to finance trips. To new worlds right. are not in it for altruistic reasons. Well, though you know, in the new world, our new world, uh, North, the North and South and Central American continents, mm-hmm. you know, they tried to bring religion over to the over to to the the Native Americans, and with you know, some sometimes they did good, sometimes they did not do good. Um, but as I say in, in, in Eden, at the end, you know, as the story evolves, they eventually decide they have to leave Earth, and they have the species that they think they need to destroy, and so they bring about a great flood that t- tries to destroy, um, uh, you know, all, all, all the, the, the humans on Earth, and that's also part of the Sumerian myth. And as part of the Sumerian myth, they, um, the Adamu get warned, and in this case it's a warning from Nima, and 
she saves many of these people who eventually go on to evolve and create the first civilization, Sumeria, Sumeria mm -hmm. in what is today Iraq, right. and and then in, in the entire uh, species of, of human begins to evolve. And in in the end, she comes to realize that one of the fears that her brother had of leaving these people alive was that they would become too much like them themselves, like the Anunnaki, and become too greedy and so forth. And that was why he wanted to wipe the earth clean. Start over again. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and and so that there would be a superior species. Right. Would be trained by, would be... Well, what would what would, what would what would cause a better outcome the second time around? Well, the second time around, if they had wiped out all of the the uh, Adamu, then the the original uh, primate species would evolve at their own space, uh, own speed. Uh huh. Right. Well, well, we, here's uh, again uh, the one thing here is um, you know we're talking on one hand about um, you know your 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 novella and 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 and, and Sitchin's work um, as a, a kind of uh, you know um, jumping point. However, that's one way of looking at it. You can also just look at the whole issue. So, um, uh, because um, this 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 does bring up um, that well-known remark that um, Stephen uh, Hawking had made recently um, that, uh, you know, he thinks that we're, many people are just, the assumption, make the assumption that uh, the the alien races would be intelligent and, and, and not only intelligent, but uh, very moral. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case, that, that actually they would just, that we could just possibly be dinner for them. Exactly. Um, or I, slaves. Right, exactly. However, that's one argument, but there's there's also another argument that um, quite you know that uh, uh, because I, I personally believe morality is a subspecies of intelligence. So it's it's in a, in a way it's more it's superior to intelligence in a way because it's a form of intelligence, uh, but it, uh, but you can have intelligent beings, of course, who are or don't have any morality at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and but and others that do, and so the morality comes later, uh, whether or not you know, whether there's some uh, ingredients um, in the in the genes or whatever that makes uh, one species more moral than another. That's another question. But uh, this this question of that that when you have uh, these advanced beings and we can, that and that we can expect no more of them than from ourselves, even though. They've had advanced scientifically and technologically, you know, vastly more than we have. But morally, they're at the same level, or perhaps even worse. Well, in in it, it, every species, I think, will have good and bad. And in 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 Eden, the Anunnaki has a certain degree of greed that they're involved in, but Nima. Um, who is the, the narrator of a large portion of the the book, loves the Adamu and, 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 and sacrifices herself for for their well being. Mm -hmm. um, you see that in 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 human evolution or, or rather history all the time, but you also see greed coming in and, and often outdoing good. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just. Uh, I, I'm. I'm a, a kind of idealistic. <laughs> uh, probably. Probably. Maybe more than you, yourself. Uh, I, I will. I mean. I will say this. Uh, I, I do think that uh, you can have a highly advanced species, and um, you know, over you know, who over you know, thousands of years, even uh, more, you know, or millions of years, and and theoretically, even though they're so highly advanced intellectually, they are. Absolutely, what we would call immoral, or I lack any morality whatsoever. It's just, in, it's just that I have a hard time thinking that for very simple reasons. Because uh, if you have no morality, then the species would constantly be at war with each other. 
I mean, the thing about the ethics and uh, what's what's called morality and you know, the basic uh, the basic thing, morality. Um, that's kind of a glue. I mean, it's, yes, it's the you know love and, and 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 caring and respecting and following certain rules and so forth and so on, but uh, it also has a very practical component uh, because um, if uh, if a species is going to survive, um, this uh, thing called morality uh, is is a kind of a defense mechanism so that they don't destroy each other. As a matter of fact. If we may not, we very well may not make it. Many many thinkers think we won't. I know Michio Kaku is a person who who thinks we're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Uh, He thinks we got about a hundred years. If I if if I if I if I if I understand him correctly, Um, I could be maybe I would I'm incorrectly interpreting what he says. But um, uh, and so and so if we if that happens, it's because we just our moral development cannot. Did not keep up with our technological development. Um, so I have a hard time thinking. That's like, for example, so we, we, if we, we don't we don't have the moral development, we're going to we're going to destroy ourselves. If we do have the moral development, then the the, the 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 thinking would be, well, then we will we will survive. And so if you have this this alien species that is you know thousands of years, maybe a million years more advanced than we than we well, more time to advance than we have. Uh, and uh, it w- one would think that if they survive, then maybe they have to be moral simply because they did survive. Or because they decided to save themselves, but maybe that uh-huh. doesn't extend to other species. Oh, um, well, that, that's, a very, that's another interesting question as well. Yeah, that, that's, that's another question, probably, probably a little bit too um, far afield from our discussion. Uh, but that's it's a very interesting question. That 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 goes to that's a, a philosophical argument about you know is is is, all, is morality intrinsically universal or not? Mm-hmm. So you can ha- you can have basically an, in, an selfish morality in the sense that you care very much about those. I mean, that's, I would call that a mafioso morality. <laughs> they love their families. Right. <laughs> well, look at our own history. We 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 survived the Cold War, uh-huh. but you know we have wiped out thousands of other species. Right. Well, uh, I, I as as an animal rights uh, as as, a, as an animal lover, me too. Uh, yeah, an animal rights person and a lifelong vegetarian. Um, I I uh, certainly um, understand that, um, but nonetheless, um, I also realize that um, many people don't think the same way that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm. Yeah, so I, I, I see what you're saying, but I, I, necess- I wouldn't necessarily logically make that connection, even though I am uh, a believer that animals do have, I don't know if I would call it rights, but they, they certainly are under the, under the um, umbrella of uh, love, I would say, that they need to be treated with compassion. I have always considered animals be the, uh, the superior, more intelligent species, because you've never seen an animal build an atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Um, that's true, but they didn't do it because they were, um, they, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess to say, if, if you don't have the ability to do something, that makes you smarter because you can't, can't don't have an opportunity to be that stupid. <laughs> but I, 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 I have a feeling that the tigers and the and the gorillas probably would build one. Unfortunately, if they could. <laughs> Sounds like Planet of the Apes now. <laughs> um, yeah, so but you, you know what we're talking is, is great because it just shows you how uh, how much um, meaning is in this whole theory. I, I personally feel that um, uh, we you know we had a little help along the way. Now, by the way, having said that. Having said the fact that you know, having said that, well, I believe the uh, the humans had a little help along the way in, in in their development. It doesn't answer the question how the whole thing got started. So that's not that doesn't in any way um, bypass the, the subject of creation or God or you know so forth and so on. No, no, because no, know, just goes, even even scientists say that the closer they get to understanding the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe 
the closer they feel they're getting to God. Because once mm-hmm. you get to that point of that sudden expansion, mm-hmm. they can't explain why or what was there before. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, that's absolutely that's absolutely true. Matter of fact, they and they admit that is. I mean, once you do that, you're beyond sight. You're beyond space and time. Right. I mean, you're, that's true nothingness. I mean, right. there were, I mean, in terms of the, it, it, without going into alternative universes or in parallel universes, or whatever. Uh, before the just look in terms of the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there is nothing, and that's incomprehensible for the human mind. Right. By nothing, there's no space, there's no time, no matter, no nothing. <laughs> or no, not not no nothing, no anything. <laughs> but, but you you were t- you were getting onto the track of you know the, the human species had a little help. Right. Um, <laughs> I think one of the, the questions out there that would kind of lends itself to um, the ancient alien theory is the big brain event. Um, 50,000 years ago, the human brain in a very relatively, in terms of evolutionary periods, uh, in a very short evolutionary time period, mm-hmm. doubled in size right. and gave us the capability to become who we are right now. How did that happen? No one knows. Absolutely, and that's one of the major reasons why I believe in in something like um, the ancient alien theory. Um, I, I know uh, one of the uh, writers in the subject, um, he, he recently passed away. Uh, he was a commentator, really, on, on Sitchin. Um, but um, he, um, he, he said that uh, the, the human species is really genetically flawed more than any more than other animals we have all these and, and I, again I'm no biologist so it's, you know I, I stand corrected if uh, you know, if I'm if I'm stating something that's not true but what was said is um, that uh, we just have more um, genetic um, di- malfunctions and, and disorders than, than other animals on this planet and it's almost as if we were kind of put together in a rush <laughs> <laughs> a little sloppy uh, well, who, who is it? Um, Dr. Crick, one of the co-founders yes. of DNA. Yeah, yeah, sure, right. He he says that there had to be some sort of manipulation because the idea of this happening of uh, 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 our genetic code cre- being created just naturally uh-huh. is too much to believe. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and coming from Crick, so that's that's pretty that's a pretty good ally in this argument, right? Um, however, it does the the thing. The only thing it's like the, it's very similar to the Big Bang, you know, uh, uh, or is there a parallel universe? Let's say, I mean, you need to when you regress backwards, where you know you still have that mystery, right? So we might have had help, and the the aliens who helped us might have had help, and so forth and so on. But at a certain point in time, if you if you assume there is no intelligent life or there's no life, and then suddenly there was life, um, where did it all? Begin? How did it all begin exactly? Yeah. Well, um, b- before we take a break, I just want to let uh, folks know that um, uh, Martin's website is uh, www. martinroyhill. com, just as it sounds, martinroyhill. dot com. And you can find uh, his website there and uh, all the and, and all the information about all the books that he's written. So we're going to take a, a short break, and uh, and we'll pick up uh, pick up from where we left off. So stay tuned. In Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms, Arthur D. Schwartz presents an ethical theory that is a framework for evaluating moral conundrums that go beyond legalistic rulemaking, dogmatism, and preconditioned thinking. The book is as much an ethical framework for unconventional ideas as it is for staying with convention. Ethical Empowerment is a manifesto of non-doctrinaire perspective. Ultimately, the hypnotic thinking of ideology and dogmatism can only be overcome by returning to the true source and essence of morality, which is nothing less than universal love. 
Discover how the philosophically liberating approach of the ethical empowerment can be applied to the range of ethical, social, and political controversy. Read about a plan to eliminate all political parties. Entertain the possibility of an overhaul of the patent system and its replacement with a system that rewards inventors while eliminating monopolistic control of patents and technological suppression. Many other transformative ideas are discussed in the book, including issues related to the monetary system, real estate, scientific paradigms, and a rational approach to conspiracy theory. While ethical empowerment will challenge your mind to consider new perspectives, the ethical challenge is always to keep the diversity, depth, and breadth of perspective within the boundaries of love. Ethical Empowerment is available at Amazon.com and most online booksellers in both print and ebook editions. Are you a person who enjoys intellectual social interaction and finds digging deeper into the nature of things, from big issues to everyday life, an important part of the pleasure of life? Social Philosophizers is a Boston area social club for those who desire intellectual socializing. It's a club for both singles and non-singles, and for anyone who finds intellectually mingling to be the best form of social mingling. The club offers a variety of interesting venues, such as philosophical get-togethers in private venues, book discussions concerning literature and philosophy, topical discussions over brunch or dinner, guest speakers, theater, after-work mixers, even long philosophical ruminations along nature trails or city streets and more. If you live in the greater Boston area or occasionally spend time in the area, you can choose a cost-effective membership level that's right for you. Basic membership is free. Find the link on Arthur's Philosophical Perspectives show page at artistsverse.com or just search socialphilosophizers.com. We hope you'll join Social Philosophizers today. That's socialphilosophizers.com. Thanks for joining us on Philosophic Perspectives. Let's get back to your host. It's Arthur D. Schwartz. Why, thank you, Scott. So I'm back here with my, my guest. Martin Roy Hill, and uh, the authors of, of many books, um, but um, specifically the author of Eden. Uh, a, uh, it's available uh, uh, ebook. Um, is it uh, print also or just the uh, ebook? Martin, it, it's both print and ebook available from Amazon.com. Great, great. Well, you know this subject. Let's let's get into some details um, about. Uh, the reasons why a lot of people think there had to be something, some kind of intervention in the development of the human race in terms of their evolution and their uh, their, uh, their development, social and technological development as well. And so what often comes up um, are uh, of the pyramids, of course, in Egypt. Correct. Um, not only in Egypt, but in, uh, you know, in, 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 um, South and Central America, mm -hmm. there were pyramids built um, as large as um, Giza and in the same formation based on the the, um, um, the three stars of Orion's belt. And you just have to wonder why, why did they all decide to build pyramids in that formation? Um, at all, the same time. At, yeah. And also, why build a pyramid? I mean, it's not a very... Right. Uh, you know, it, it's it's not a really good construction idea concept. You can't live in a pyramid, right. um, and you can't and you don't bury in it. There's you know, tr contrary to popular belief, there are no pharaohs buried in any of the pyramids on Giza. Right. They're all buried in the in the valley of the pharaohs. So, what were the pyramids built for, and how were they built? If um, mainstream science tells us that they just had thousands of workers who dragged big bold, uh, big blocks of, of um, rocks, you know, across the desert and somehow lifted them into place on 
on, on, on these massive um, edifices. But, you know, that sounds as... Doesn't frankly, really make a lot far, of sense. <laughs> yes, it, it seems as far out as the idea that aliens came and helped them. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's 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 much easier to believe that do they that there was an exceptional, exceptional, an exceptional event that allowed that to happen than not. Right. Now we do know that the ancients had far greater knowledge than we give them credit for. We like to think of them as being very primitive mm-hmm. in their knowledge, but. Um, we know that you know. I'm I'm a I'm a uh, a combat casualty care um, specialist for the Navy. So I I know of this Greek Roman doctor from um, named Galen from that back in the days of the Ro- Roman Empire was doing extraordinary medical procedures, including cataract surgery and such. And he said he got all of his information from the Library of Alexandria. And if that's true, then that means that the Greeks and the Egyptians had advanced knowledge. Um, And we do know that the Egyptians did have advanced knowledge of medical procedures, including um, um, what's called trepanation, opening up the skull so that the uh, injured brain can can expand, you know, swell, without herniating the brain stem. Right. Where did they learn this? Exactly. It's, it's just logical because we know that our development, um, our scientific development, took you know, th- you know hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and ac- very little happened, actually, relatively speaking, until maybe 150 years ago, really. Right, right. Uh, relatively speaking. And, I mean, not to, it was a lot of un- important things happened before then, you know, Newton and so forth, but... Uh, in, ter- in terms of technology, 150 years, let's say, right? Right. Um, Galen, mm-hmm. during the Roman Empire, had a knowledge of um, what's called germ theory, that there were some kinds right. of unseen um, entities that created infection in wounds, and he treated them with poultices of wine and tea, both of which we now know are antimicro- have antimicrobial right. um, um, activity. That didn't come about in European um, science again until the mid 1800s. Right. 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 Yeah. With um, uh, what's the name? The, the the great doctor, French doctor, Pasteur, right? Right. And and, and, and so, well, yeah, but yeah, and, and but what I'm saying here is, it, it took a long time for us, for this to evolve. So now you have um, this doctor in uh, is Ro- um a Roman doctor, and uh, suddenly he, he got he said he got it from got it from the uh, the library in, in Alexandria, and uh, how many years um, civilization wasn't that old at that point in time? Right, right. I mean, as, as far as we understand civilization, uh, and and there's no record of of any kind of uh, development of that sort of scientific knowledge. Right. And so it, it seems like it was just in, it's in the library, like it was just given. It, it, exactly, and what it reminds me of is like um, in the military, they go on um, what are called medcaps, medical civil uh, action program, right. where you you send in a medical team to a third world country, and they do um, they do some medical treatments on some of the um, um, local individuals, and then they also try to train. Um, even non um, doc, non physician people on how to do certain procedures, and it, it it almost sounds like somebody did that tens of thousands of years ago. Right, and tens of thousands of years ago was way beyond our understanding of humans of when the start of start of human civilization was. Right. Right. All right. What's what is it, about five thousand years? How about the Sumeria? When, when Samaria was about five to six thousand years ago, and that's the oldest record that we have. And that that that's always been considered the oldest uh, civilization, mm-hmm. but there is now some talk that there may have been one in um, South or Central America that was actually older. And of course, there's uh, the old uh, myth, or if you want to call it a myth, or the or the reality of uh, Atlantis. Correct. 
um, which could have gone back further. Mm -hmm. um, so th these these questions are, seem have have so much. Um, it's reasonable. I mean, I don't. There's no one. You know, there's no proof for you know, anything. You, all you can look at is for you know evidence for and evidence against. But here's the thing about it: the information that we're talking about is is so important, or the the topic that we're talking about tonight is so important in my view because it's an example of how people simply close their minds. Right. Uh, it's just it, and this the all of academia, all of archaeology, all of anthropology, all this the so called anomalous facts that we have because they are anomalies, they can be sh you know sho you shoved under the rug, swept under the rug well yeah and, and and so much of what we think about in terms at least of history and archaeology and that is in, because it's you know in science you always want to be able to re reproduce an experience experiment mm -hmm. there's not a lot of ways you can do that when it comes to history and that um you look at the evidence and you come up with theories and the theories get bought into by a certain number of people and then it becomes uh you know a consensus and that becomes historical fact mm -hmm. but then a few years later, that all changes. I mean, in this country, we still celebrate Columbus Day, even though we now know that the Vikings reached Newfoundland 300 years before Columbus. Why aren't we not celebrating Leif Erikson Day? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I, I as a school I, as a schoolboy, and that was quite a while ago. I mean, I, I even knew about Leif Erikson. Um, we've known that for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the quite, I mean, it's true. For, and also the fact that you know Columbus did, does what we know it now is that he wasn't really exactly an icon. <laughs> he wasn't exactly a saint, but with no. to put it that way. So nor was Leif Erikson, by the way. Um, uh, you know, the, the, they, we were a pretty rough character as well. Um, but you know, that's uh, it's an interesting thing because that's actually the holiday is not really for the discovery of America, but the the, the advent of of uh, the European colonization. Yeah, and uh, but that in itself is a, is is a topic uh, because uh, it seems to me that everything is stacked against sh uh, uh, up, uh, you know uh, upsetting the apple cart of our so-called knowledge. Well, yeah, and in the military we have a term called you know upsetting somebody's rice bowl or sticking your fingers in somebody's rice bowl. It's where they they make their living and. You know, darn it! You're not supposed to touch it or upset it, and and there's a lot of that in academia too. Uh huh. Um, but I think I think there's in, in you know there's a whole realm of crypto science out there that oh, includes you know ancient aliens and you know Bigfoot type creatures and paranormal phenomena, and I think that there's more and more growing acceptance among mainstream scientists. Into at least some of these um, uh, creatures or, 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 or you know beliefs, uh, for for hundreds of years, um, in the days of sail and you know men were made of iron and ships of wood and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. There were um, legends of a great uh, sea monster called the Kraken, which was uh -huh. like a giant squid that sometimes would attack the ships um keep in mind when back in those days the ships were not that really not that big when columbus came to the new world he was in a 40-foot ship um mainstream science kind of poo-pooed that as just you know sea legend well today we know there are giant squids out there you know a hundred foot long squids they live very deep in the water but they are coming up to the surface more and more. They've been photographed. So Do they attack? Th there have been reports of them attacking small boats, like sailboats okay. boats and stuff. Yeah. Wow. And and yet, you know, there's been evidence of that going on for going back to at least the 30s that I know of, where they've had 30-foot um, squids wash, dead squids wash up on shore. Right. Um, and it then just recently in some deep sea camera work they were able to photograph some 
uh, much larger squids than that. Right. Yeah, I mean, every, it's, it, this is just so another example of uh, something that was supposedly not true or impossible suddenly becomes possible. And that's not not a, not any great uh, you know great revelation. It, it's just that I really it, I really have a, a, a problem with um, a closed mind and uh, closing the door when over and over and over again we have incidents where we find out that we were wrong. And I think it would be if we could just open our mind to, to just investigate and to research and to explore without uh, a sense of being held back by preconception, I think we, we'd be a lot better for it, that's my view. I, I think so, too. I mean, think about um, space travel. Um, everybody you know, talks about, thinks that, that the, the rocket age began with the Nazis and the V-2 rocket and um, Von Braun. Right. But the, in fact, it was an American scientist, Dr. Robert Goddard, who invented the oh, sure. fuel rocket, right? And, and the geostabilization of that. And he talked about using rockets for space travel, and he was ridiculed here in this country. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and then after the war, what did we do? We, in, we sent... Um, we, we brought a bunch of Nazi scientists to the United States to build rockets because right. we were so far behind because we didn't listen to one of our own kinsmen right. who had the uh, who was the original idealist. Yeah, it's just that's just what that's what dogma will do for you. Yeah, um, I, I got I, this one, Scott. I know I'm behind schedule, so if you could just uh, take a break now, and uh, we have an unorthodox schedule this time, but uh, we'll have a little bit of time when we get back. So we'll take a break right now. This is Arthur D. Schwartz. You know, beliefs and disbeliefs can be very powerful. Much like philosophy, hypnotism is concerned with belief. Hypnotherapy, a practical application of hypnotism, may largely be described as the practice of removing false beliefs that form mental blocks to success, to happiness, and to well-being. In my hypnotherapy, and philosophical counseling practice, I combine my work in philosophy with hypnotism in order to clear mental blockages that can occur on both conscious and subconscious levels. A mental block may be conscious or subconscious and can be expressed, for example, in the form of anxiety, low self-esteem or low motivation, bad habits, tobacco habits, weight gain, low performance, and much more. If you are interested in using hypnosis and the power of the mind to overcome mental blocks and barriers that have emerged in your life, please feel free to give me a call at 617-964-4800 or visit www.integralhypnosis.com. That's I N T E G R A L hypnosis dot com. When tornadoes raked the South, it was ham radio that was on the air, saving lives. As communities lay in ruins, it was the hams who let their families know their loved ones were safe. When the power and cell phones went out, the hams were there, helping rescuers get the message through. Wherever catastrophes strike, amateur radio is ready. Amateur radio works when other communications don't. Contact the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, on the web at emergencyradio.org. That's emergencyradio.org. You're listening to another great radio broadcast of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Back to your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Thank you very much, Scott. Well, I'm here again with Martin Roy Hill, the author of Eden, as well as uh, many other books. And um, once again, you can find him on www.martinroyhill.com. 
Royhill.com. MartinRoyHill.com. Um, just as it sounds. Uh, well, there is something called the Baghdad Battery, which is very interesting. So I'd like uh, Martin to talk about that for a little bit. Right. Um, th- there have been um, originally discovered in Baghdad. I think they've been discovered elsewhere, too, but these ancient um, jars that have electrodes made of, um, I believe it's copper, and um, what they what happens is you pour um, an acidic liquid into the jar like wine or tea and you stick the electrode in there and it generates a small amount of electricity. So they've been called the Baghdad battery and the question has always been what were they used for? Uh, the mainstream um, thought on this is that they were used for electroplating that seems a little bit bizarre because these batteries, these jars are not that big. And if if you're going to electroplate something, I would think that you would make a bowl, put your electrodes in there, and then lay your your, your objects into the bowl to um, electroplate them. Um, the ancient alien theory is that they were used to uh, perhaps light light up the uh, the, the, the pyramids during disca- the, uh, construction because they still don't know how they were able to get light deep in, inside of these pyramids. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no sign that they carried torches or anything because there would be, you know, um, smoke marks on, on the ceilings and so forth. People say, well, there was, you know, there were no light bulbs back then, but everybody in this country kind of thinks Edison invented the light bulb, but he didn't. No, he didn't. The, the, right. the, the, the Light bulb existed for many, many, many years before Edison created a filament that was long-lasting. Right. So it's very likely, or very possible, I should say, that maybe the ancients did have some some ancient form of uh, light bulb that you know burned for a few hours um, before it burned out, rather than um, you know what we have today, where they last for you know months uh. and so forth. Yeah, well, I I would think if the ancient aliens were the ones that basically built the pyramid, they would probably have had a better battery than what we talk about. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, but, but then who taught? Who? who then right. maybe they taught mm-hmm. our ancients right. how to build them in a very crude format. Right. That, that's a possibility. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, you you're having a highly advanced technology. Uh, I think we we certainly couldn't build the build, uh, pyramids today, from what I understand. It's, I don't think our engineering. I mean, I I I don't mean to misstate it, but I I think I've I've read and heard that uh, we really couldn't do it. No, and and um, uh, stone construction like at uh, Puma Punko um, near Lake Titicaca, um, they have these huge. Blocks that look like they were interlinked parts of a of a wall, and they are so intricately constructed. They, it looks like they were the, the right. sections were cut out with the use of something like a laser. Right. And stonemasons today say they could not do that kind of work with all of the modern equipment they have. Right. So how did how did they get built? And what were they built for? Right. And uh, so again, it's just I mean, how you, you have these things, and it's just sort of uh, overlooked. And the idea that what is interesting when you talk, start talking about the Baghdad battery or the, or the, the version of it, um, the, what they found in the pyramids. Um, is it makes sense that if you have this advanced uh, civilization and they would be recruiting, you know, uh, primitive beings in the construction of it and they would be giving, you know, they'd be, you know, giving them access to these, you know, very primitive types of lighting, for example. Mm-hmm. That would be part of the process of, you know, of, of introducing, you know, the idea of technology without... Um, uh, 
you know, without just basically giving it to them. Right. I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, that's, it, I think Star Trek and all, is, you, keep, you keep coming back to an advanced civilization and how are they going to interact with the primitive species that they would come in contact with. Right, because you don't want to give them too much technology or they'll kill themselves. Uh, yeah, right. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if they, if, I don't know. Maybe there's just something that is understood that um, each so each species has to it has to evolve and you have to draw a line where you can help but not help too much i don't know uh, but it just seems like something like that um uh might be at work you know be, because i mean i i think yeah species could probably take uh, uh primitives and then uh, put them in schools and uh um you know do all kinds of things and uh, basically um uh, Spit out intelligent, uh, intelligent beings in pretty short order. Uh, basically, almost in terms of uh, like uh, uploading information into a computer or something. You know, I mean, if they're that advanced, uh, who knows how? You know, but th- th- something by doing so, you, you have to think that you're doing something that's wrong. Right. And the question is, why is it wrong? And uh, it just would seem that that is the case, though. I think it I think if you introduce someone too much too too quickly it would um I I guess I'd say you know in such a simplistic term say it would go to their head. Uh-huh. I uh-huh. You know I've I've been a an investigative reporter and I've been around for a long time and I've seen how people React when they get too much of a good thing. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, yeah, we see that today, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I think it's a uh, you know maybe maybe that's why you know the Catholic Church always objected to too much science, mm-hmm. yeah. even though they had their own scientists, their own observatories, and they were seeing the same thing that you know other people were say, seeing. Um, but they didn't want everybody else. Maybe maybe it was more than just you know they didn't want to lose control of their uh, devotee, de- devotees. Um, maybe they were afraid of what might happen if they had too much information. Uh, yeah, and, and also um, to me, it's uh, a kind of a, uh, it, well. I'm thinking about this now as we're going along, but it's a spiritual thing uh, that um, I mean, I, I'm someone who like to think you know you don't have to go through these stages of development. You can just you know, uh, if it's wisdom, if it's understanding, let's use it. Um, however, you know, maybe there is some innate conservative element that says. Uh, yes, but not too much. That this speech, because if you don't go through the stages of of understanding, of enlightenment, then you your soul is missing something mm. that you haven't experienced what it means to learn and to to awaken. And I'm, you know what, I'm just making this up as I go on. I'm, I'm saying I'm saying things right now that I really disbelieve in. <laughs> I'm thinking of Hegel in particular, in particular, who actually while condemning slavery, justified it as a, as a necessary path to enlightenment, to, to um, a higher consciousness for the slaves, which, of course, I think is absolutely horrific and well, disgusting. Ma- ma- many people thought that. Um, you know, I think it was Ro- uh, Robert E. Lee who said, yes, they should be free, but what would they do? <laughs> right, you know, and this is, uh, I know we're going quite a field, but this is kind of the, the point uh, I'm, I'm making that you have a, um, there's something about bringing um, a, a less advanced being um, along and the right way and the wrong way to do it. However, having said that, I firmly believe that whatever. Uh, whatever that means, it doesn't exclude compassion. That's the thing. It doesn't. It doesn't exclude, um, you know, a loving, you know, kindness. So that, and that's where, 
you know, when you're talking about things like slavery or talk about um, all other kinds of atrocities, um, there's no there's no love there at all. Or certainly not no 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 love in terms of the the uh, the aliens who might have uh, you know uh, destroyed the human race or tried to. Maybe they, you know, some people say maybe they did, and maybe there was a, a civilization beyond what evo- the one that evolved into what we have today. Uh, right, right. So now, it, 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 what we have today would be now that, that a positive or a negative? No, it's it's just a statement that some you know there are some who theorize, theorize that there was an advanced civilization on Earth right. before that dis- disappeared, and then we went through this whole growth situation again to reach to where we are right now. Uh huh. Yep. Well, I I think we could um, talk for another hour easily, Um, but right now I think um, Scott was uh, very generous, letting us go a little bit longer. Uh, But um, I want to thank you, uh, Martin, that's Martin Roy Hill, for for joining me and talking about um, uh, the ancient alien hypothesis and all many of the ramifications and the questions and... um, the mysteries that re- that that, uh, that that this subject has, um, it's really uh, it's great to have you with with me today. And uh, do you, would you like to um, have any? Do you have any other remarks right now, or do you want to uh, plug any of your books or anything like that before we close tonight? Um, anybody who wants to know about any of my mystery thrillers or my sci-fi novella, Eden, can um, look me up at my website. If, as you said, www dot martinroyhill dot com or on Amazon. And Arthur, I thank you very much for this uh, chance to uh, reach out to your audience, and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Martin. It's been great. I really appreciate it. So this does uh, conclude tonight's broadcast. Uh, for links to my book, Ethical Empowerment, my philosophical counseling and hypnotherapy practice, and the Social Philosophizers Club, please visit arthurdschwartz dot com. And this is Arthur D. Schwartz reminding you to live well and think deeply. So until next time, good night, everybody.